Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Welcome to uh, Talks at Google, presented by Mixed at Google, in partnership with Pride at and Gain, which are several of our amazing employee resource groups at Google. I am Rachel Green, your moderator for today. And here at Google, I serve as the Global Diversity and Recognition Program Manager for Google Cloud. My pronouns are she, her, and today, we have the esteemed pleasure of having Dr. Andrew Jolivet join us for a personal discussion on intersectionality and how that shows up for him as someone who identifies as mixed and queer. Before he joins us, I'd like to take a quick moment to share more about his background. Dr. Andrew Jolivet is a professor and chair of the Ethics Study Department at the University of California, San Diego, as well as the inaugural founding director of Native American and Indigenous Studies at UCSD. A former professor and department chair of American Indian Studies at San Francisco State University, he is the author slash editor of nine books in print or forthcoming, including a book entitled Indian Blood, HIV, and colonial trauma in San Francisco's two-spirit community. His scholarships uh, in examine uh, Native American, Indigenous, Creole, Black, Latinx, Latinx, queer, mixed race, and comparative critical ethics studies. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Dr. Andrew Jolivet. Uh, good afternoon, relatives. Thank you so much uh, for having me. It's such a pleasure to be with you. Um, I'd like to um, just acknowledge uh, the Chochenyo Ohlone people of Uchin, uh, also known as Oakland, California, where I'm speaking to you all from today. Um, I know that folks are watching live, and so we can't put this in the chat, but I think you all can comment over at um, um, uh, YouTube, I think. Um, and it's just uh, HTTPS uh, native-land.ca. Again, that's native-land.ca. You can look up by the name of the city or the zip code, what uh, indigenous territory you're in. So if you'd like to share that, if you don't already know where you are. Um, so I'd like to do that and acknowledge also my own ancestors, the Atacapal Ishak people of uh, Southwest Louisiana. Uh, I come from the Tisikip or Huron Opelousa um, clan. And I'd also like to acknowledge, which we don't do an, uh, as much, right? That we want to do more than just acknowledge, you know, land. But what are we going to do about the what what we've done with land, right? And, and that mm -hmm. dispossession, that displacement, but also the labor, right? And also the labor, not and, not but. I like to always distinguish with the but and um, and and really do a both and. So and what are we going to do about the labor, right? So I also want to acknowledge the labor of you know, um, enslaved people of African descent, enslaved indigenous people, which we forget that indigenous peoples, native peoples in this country were also enslaved um, and the free labor performed there as well as that labor um, performed by immigrant refugee um, communities and populations that allow us, right, how we deal with issues like racial capital. So, um, you know, with that said, it's such an honor to be with you all today and um, thank you so much, yeah. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much for providing that. <clears throat> um, in my introduction, I read a portion of your bio, and uh, as someone who has written a number of bios in the past, I know how difficult it can be to include everything in a bio that makes you you. So um, to dive into this discussion on intersectionality, I'd like to invite you to share a bit more about your background with our viewers that's not listed in your professional bio. Mm. You know, I think the first thing that comes to mind that's maybe it's a little bit there, but my first loves really are cooking um, and poetry. Growing up, you know, being in a kitchen, I think about my mom, my dad, um, my siblings, family, my grandmothers. I think about the smells, um, the taste, obviously, which is the best part, I think, for us. Um, but for me, it's really about community. And so a lot of my work I talk about, and I think it's connected, right, about things like kinship. And so for me, when I think about kinship, you know, family time, community time is so much about 
food. It is about music. It's about dance. It's about living. It's about life. It's about what I talk about is thrivance, right? How we, mm -hmm. you know, don't just focus on being sort of resilient, but how are we really thriving in our communities? So um, what else would I share that's not in the bio? Um, yeah, I, there's just, I, I, I think about um, other hobbies or things like that, photography mm -hmm. is that I really love. Um, yeah, I, I I think those are my main things that I would say. And so hopefully I'm, I'm an aspiring chef. So hopefully one day I would love to um, have my own little cafe or uh, restaurant to cook and um, just share with people. Yeah, I, I love that. That's that's one of my favorite questions whenever I interview someone. It's like, what's not included on your bio? Because you just learn so many interesting things. And I love the connection between food and culture. Um, I know that that's not always like related or, or um, like people don't talk about it as much, but it is so connected. And having dinner with someone or, or, or um, breaking bread with someone is such a great way to build authentic relationships and build um, bridges of unifying uh, cultures across um, all, all, all boards. So thank you so much for sharing that. Um, since today's event is a part of a week-long celebration of Loving Week, which commemorates the U.S. Supreme Court case of Loving versus Virginia, which struck down the remaining state laws against interracial marriage throughout the country, and we're also here to celebrate Pride Month, I'd like to know from you, what are some of your favorite things about being mixed and queer? Hmm. You know, it's funny you ask that question in the sense of it's something that's come up for me before. And I tell people, I'm like, I love the skin I'm in. Oh, I love right. the body I'm in. Uh, what's that Beyonce sound? Brown skin girl. Mm -hmm. I love that song. It was just my niece's graduation from high school this weekend. And I was, I did a talk earlier today for community college out in Indianapolis. And I was sharing with them. It was also for, it was for their pride month. Um, and I was just kind of sharing with them. Um, in 2002, I was diagnosed with AIDS, um, advanced HIV. Um, I had 35 T cells. My viral load was 500,000. And number one, I shared with them and I share with you, actually, it saved my life in more ways than one, right? I, and people, I remember a former partner saying, what do you mean, Andrew? Don't say that. Or I was, I said, I'm glad it happened to me. And that's when they said, no, no, you shouldn't say that. And then I was sharing that the reason I say that is because it, changed how I look at the world, how I relate to other people, how I see my people around me. I see you, Rachel, as medicine, right? That we shared and talked even in prepping for this, that now we're connected and that's that that's a kinship that we have. Even if even if we never see each other again or even in person, there's always that connection. And I really believe that. And I think that's something really unique um, and special. And I think for queer folks, um, you know, myself and for mixed race folks, all these challenges of like where there's the overlap is everybody's talking about CRT this week, critical race theory, right? It's this hot button issue. I just did an interview with San Diego Times Tribune and I told them this is a non-issue. Like why is this even controversial? Everyone who cares about not just justice, but just cares about humanity, about our dignity should be a big proponent for critical race theory because really it's about justice for all of us. And Absolutely. so when I think about being a mixed race person, and I wrote about this in the book I edited um, about President Obama being the first, bi you know, or being biracial and and first um, person of color, African-American, mixed race person, so many things, right? President mm -hmm. was what it means for me, I think sometimes as a mixed person is, and not always, I don't want to glamorize, I don't like sometimes we do that too much, is that our experience is that you learn to live really very much, very strongly in multiple worlds, right? And we do that as folks of color too, whether mixed or not, like black folks are good native folks, yeah, Latinos, Asian, you know, everybody's got their ways in which we do code switching, right? Um, mm -hmm. Or what you always talked about is double consciousness, right? You act one way at home and then you talk another way with your friends or your family. I think for mixed race folks, it's even more nuanced, right? Um, and so for me, it's an interesting, there's a, there's a real um, uniqueness. And for me, it goes back to the cultural part. And I think the same for the queerness is that 
there's something about being denied something in both categories or being a target, being rejected. Um, you know, growing up, I was sharing with these folks too, like, being called the N word, being called the F word, right? Um, this convergence and that we see these kind of shifts. I think about the Dan Savage campaign years back, more than a decade now, I think of it gets better. It doesn't get better for who, right? And in what ways we think about bullying and we think about our trans relatives, right? I really want to encourage folks to think about kinship as opposed to allyship. And so for me, being queer and mixed race has allowed me to see multiple experiences together and which means multiple issues and so when we think about intersectionality i've been really actually rethinking that a little bit that it's not about intersections it's about our holistic selves we come all of ourselves together we're not fragments we're not parts polygon allen said we are not you know part we are all in all Mm -hmm. I think that's the joy for me is being in a club and feeling, even though I'm not, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm 46 and I'm uh, not that that's super old, but I'm like, okay, that's not necessarily the space for me anymore, I think. But I think about the club space or the music space or the concert hall, or the museum or the exhibit where there are other queer folk, other mixed race folk or the concert or the meal or the gathering in the backyard where we share story, where I think about the genealogies, the the sort of uh, queer archive of who we are, um, the mixed race archive of who we are. So those are really um, important things that we need to, that we should all honor and celebrate. Yeah, well, one of the, the pieces that you just mentioned that, that I, I love is about not focusing on the intersectionality, but the whole you. And here at Google, we do um, at, tell our Googlers to bring their whole self um, to work, to this space, to, to everything that um, you bring to the table. And so I, I love that piece. Just it, it made me think about how we um, should be showing up in this space at Google. Um, so we we talked a bit about some of uh, your favorite things, but we do recognize that several pieces of your identity face daily discrimination, biases, and in some countries, because we are um, broadcasting to a global audience, um, in, in some countries are criminalized um, even to this day. So can you share some of the challenges that you may have experienced growing up mixed and queer? Yeah, and I don't even, I would not even just limit it to growing up, just even still to this day, I walk into a space and the assumptions, I think a lot of it's the assumptions that people make and that then how do those assumptions also, how are they embedded into law, right? So again, because it's such a topic in my mind right now, I'm going to say critical race theory again, that we think about that that's just linked to race. It's not. It's about queer rights. It's about gender rights. It's about, you know, immigrant rights. It is actually about when people think, oh, it's a, an attack on white folks. No, it's not. It actually, it is a way in which we protect our white relatives or European descent relatives as well, because it's about thinking about the ways in which law as a factor, just like our queerness and our mixed race identity as factors have influenced, um, you know, how we get treated in this world. And so, you know, I actually, to be honest, let me, let me get real, right? Let me get real with y'all for a minute. Um, as I do. <laughs> to so just this year, a couple of things that have happened um, as a mixed race, black, indigenous identified person, but first and foremost, I identify as Louisiana Creole. Um, and people are just like, oh, it's light-skinned black people who speak French. I'm like, number one, I'm not light-skinned. Uh, my mom's not Creole, my dad is. Um, and then also it's like, and I barely speak French. There's such a limited definition of what it is. It's really a cultural definition, but then so much of it ignored like our native cultural contributions too, but the ways in which we define indigeneity in this country are so limited that we want to erase that where we want to make people black more black so because we disenfranchise that and make it such this hated anti-black so right it's this intersection of anti-indian anti-blackness coming together with anti-queerness well damn you're talking about some serious hate hateration right mm -hmm. so let me give you all the real tea so earlier this year i was approached um and i'll try to be as 
um, you know, legalese, right? Because we do have law stuff and not mention the university. I may mention the state, um, but I was approached to apply for a job and um, a, a, a targeted hire, something I did not apply for. Um, mm -hmm. I now have an equal rights uh, employment opportunity, civil rights case against this university because essentially they reached out to me, but then, um, and they did offer the job, don't get me wrong, but I was told by one of the administrators who's also a person of color, they're like, we are so embarrassed, we are so sorry, they lowballed you because they didn't want you to accept this offer and they knew they could not because someone questioned the fact about your indigenous background too. Mind you, this was for a senior position in black studies though, not native studies, right? And then there are also issues there around queerness, right? So here comes this black mixed and whatever, you know, um, person uh, who's also queer and that they need that on the one hand and all these universities talking that they want to after in the wake of George Floyd and Ahmaud Aubrey and Breonna Taylor and so many people are trans relatives so much black missing murdered indigenous women all these things right and then they do that <laughs> mm. right so you have that um happening earlier this year with this job um where i was just like are you are y'all serious and the only reason i'm moving forward i don't necessarily you know and I, I shouldn't say too much a lawyer would probably tell me but me i have a big mouth and i just tell it like it is um but my thing is it's about truth it's about i can't go out mm -hmm. and do the talks or share my experience and not really say, you know what, this is messed up what you guys are doing. And you shouldn't even be recruiting people if you're not serious about bringing black scholars, black intellectuals, native scholars, native and, and mixed folks, let's get real. And they're actually leading right. mixed race studies on their campus, which mm -hmm. is another irony that they are actually, and maybe I'm giving away the campus now, but that part's okay, that they are actually probably hosting a critical mixed race studies conference on that campus. So the fact mm. that, and those folks get it. So that's no disparity. They're amazing. They're awesome. The faculty. So two people make a stink and say, well, you're not, he's not really an Indian, but we don't want to, so we don't want to deal with that. Or is they are they really Indian, right? And then on top of that, there's also a native country right now, a big issue going on where um, a journalist, and I use the words loosely, um, has a list of like nearly 200 native people who are called pretend Indians. Um, and they are calling all these people out. So it is interesting if you're a mixed race person, a queer person to have someone come out and say, so for me, this is, it just, it's so re reflective of like a lifetime of people saying, you're not authentically who you say you are, right? Um, I'm not on the list, but it's funny because I had heard from some several people there that about the list. And at one point they said, oh, they're targeting black Indians, which actually in honesty and fairness to those folks, there's a handful, they're not necessarily focused on that per se. But when I called it out on Facebook, someone screenshot it, sent it to this person who then was like, had all their people going after me saying, well, maybe we better put him on the list too, right? So again, these questions mm -hmm. of question, the problematic nature of the ways in which we internalize. So I would say for me, it's also how we as queer folks and folks of color or just as queer folks and, and people living in a colonial state, I won't say settler because it's more than just set settlement happening here. This is a colonial terrorist state, right? How do we actually internalize these ideas ourselves and push back against them. So that's been my experience is really trying to push back against the limited definitions that that get placed onto us, um, onto our bodies, whether we have the, you know, I will tell my students, I'd have students come in, oh, I have blonde hair and blue eyes, but I'm from, uh, no one thinks I'm Latina. I'm like, have you been to Guadalajara? I'm like, or Jalisco? I'm like, that's what people look like. We have to push back against what the definitions of queerness and mixed race or even just monoracial categories are. And that's what mixed race people and queer people I think also offer, right? To conversations about diversity and equity. So. Yeah, yeah. I was writing down some some notes as you were talking. There were a few things that like really popped out for me. One, I'm just gonna go backwards. Um, so people uh, feeling as if they can, um, they have the right to define you and just like, you should not be able to define someone else and categorize someone else and tell them who they are, how they should show up and so forth. 
So we definitely need to get you know that right. Um, and then in your your first uh, story that you shared, talking about action and uh, how people will often react to things such as George Floyd without thoughtfulness and consideration of what should come behind that, you know. So um, really wanted to call that out. And then one of the first things that you mentioned was uh, when you were sharing about uh, how people may perceive what someone should look like or show up as being um, a Creole background. And so the misconceptions of that and how that plays, and that actually leads into uh, my next question for you in talking about the misconceptions. So um, what are some of the bis biggest misconceptions that people have about mixed race and career identities? Because especially people who aren't a part of those communities, I'm sure there are a lot of things that you know you may have he heard along the way. We're traumatic. <laughs> we are damaged, confused that we're going to have difficult lives. Um, again, to go back to, and I don't know if I said this earlier, because I may be bleeding when we have you do talks in the same day. So let me say it, because I don't think I did. And I always credit my Maori relatives from Aotearoa, from New Zealand, who shared with some of us uh, Native um, folks doing public health work. They said, y'all always talking about resiliency. They said, resiliency, that's not enough. They said, you remember those pop-up dolls? They were made out of plastic. They kind of were dome-shaped. They had sand at the bottom of them, and you'd punch them, and they would just pop back up, punch them, pop back up. They said, that's resiliency. You stay in the same place, and you just keep getting knocked back down. That's not good enough. And so in my work, I've been talking a lot about queer thrivance, you know, particularly for Black and Indigenous communities or Black Indigenous communities, um, which are not mutually exclusive. Um, and so I think, um, you know, part of what I um, hope is that we also understand that these that we're thriving, that there are places of joy, that there are misconceptions that, you know, to be mixed, to be queer, um, is always trauma filled or pain. Yeah, there's pain. Of course, there is. <laughs> Do we choose it? Do we cause it? It's external, mostly. Um, and so I think one of the concepts I talk about in one of my books, Indian Blood, HIV, and Colonial Trauma um, in San Francisco's Two-Spirit Community is this idea of radical love. And radical love is this idea that until we can actually be fully vulnerable, not with the whole world, not with some doctor that we don't know, not with some therapist that we don't know, but with our own community, people who share common identity. So maybe it's other queer people, maybe it's other mixed race folks, maybe it's mixed race queer folks, right? Um, that when we share those vulnerabilities and realize we're not alone, that's when the healing process begins. That's where kinship begins. That's where we move away from what Bishop Yvette Flunder from San Francisco City of Refuge, a queer black you know, minister, bishop, leader, in HIV, in homelessness, and so many issues. She said, when I was at this event, y'all, she said, we're so, we're not, we don't need allyship. It's forming an alliance. That's transactional. You do something for me, so I will later do something for you. Mm -hmm. And so I talk about kinship. Ever since I heard that, I said, you know what? She's right. We don't want allyship per se. I don't want you to be my ally. I want, because that's temporal. It's temporary. Kinship or ceremonial relationships are long-term. They're lifelong, they're commitments. Mm -hmm. They're about relationships, right? It's like the family tree. And we say that, right? The family tree, because those branches are into the ground, they're into the roots um, and they cannot be undone. They cannot be, they can be, un they cannot be unsevered, right? Uh, right. Or, or, yeah, or, yeah, or severed. Um, and so I, I think that's the thing that we need to realize is that these misconceptions that <laughs> were these, you know, so much all this painful stuff. Yes, there is. And at the end of the day, that intergenerational, when I talk about as an intergenerational trauma, whether that be for being mixed or queer or both, how do we resolve that, right? And the part of that is, this is why, again, I'm gonna come back to it one more, one more again, the critical race theory, because it's about actually our humanity. We should all want justice, right? We say right. we're a meritocracy in this country. 
yeah, why do we not let everyone take a test, a math test, until everyone gets an A? The mm -hmm. English or whatever it is, everybody can get an A, but we create a structure and a system where someone's got to lose. So it's not just the content that we need to change around identity, mixed or queer or otherwise. It is also the method and the practice that we need to change. Absolutely. I love your comment about kinship and I like um, how you use then you said, you know, allyship, we, we don't need that. We need kinship. And, and that's a huge concept. I was taking that in as you said that because I don't want someone to show up for me one time. That that's not being an ally. I do want that kinship. I, I don't want you to only show up for me when it's beneficial to you either. Mm -hmm. I want you to show up during the hard times when I really need someone in my corner because I would do that for you in return. So I really appreciate that that concept, and I'm gonna I'm gonna take that with me from this conversation for sure. Um, just wanted to remind everyone to, if you have questions, please submit them into the live uh, chat window. We have a few more questions to, to ask Dr. Joe Lovett. And so I'm gonna jump to our next question when I'm just gonna ask you to, let's think about uh, if we had a, a magical power to transfer back into time. So let's imagine that you could go back into time and meet your younger self. What is one thing you've learned about being mixed and queer that you wish you could tell your younger self? This is so funny because the other day I was with family and um, I think this was at my niece's graduation and I was sharing that with you, right? I thought I would never see that, right? When I was diagnosed and to see her graduate and cross that stage was such a powerful moment. So then being with family, someone said, if you could go back, what, what do you think is the ideal age you would be? And someone said 30. They said 30 is good. And then there was someone a little bit older. Well, actually, they were at our table, too. And so we asked them next door at the other table. And she said, I agree, but only if I knew what I know now. So I think there is something interesting, right? Because we have had all these things in the last, I don't know, decade or so where people were kind of asking this kind of question or write a letter to your 16-year-old self. What would you say? And you know, I have to first, let me paraphrase all of this by saying, I think that we don't know because we kind of have to walk that journey and go through it. It's almost like we ask that question so we're, as if we're gonna save ourselves from something, but then we wouldn't be the same person if we didn't walk that path, if we didn't walk that journey. Um, so I think what I would say is it's gonna be hard walk your journey anyway, love yourself anyway. Um, don't be discouraged. Um, you're beautiful just the way you are. Because I think the other things that happen is you become either mixed race or the exotic, beautiful thing to go back to your previous, a couple previous questions, right? Um, you got beautiful hair, you think you're better than everybody or um, you just want to be white or you don't want to identify with this side. The other thing is that it assumes that everybody that's mixed is mixed with white, right? And that they're mm -hmm. all Korean and, you know, Filipino or Palestinian and, you know, um, Colombian, right? That they're, you know, so I think that there's a lot of assumptions in that. Um, so that these dynamics of looks, of exotification, objectification, um, and so I think that these are important questions to ask. And then I think we have to look at the gender dynamics of this, particularly for women, right? The rapeability, this idea of, oh, well, they're just there to be possessed or, um, you know, had that this comes with a mixed race, um, you know, kind of uh, identity. I think I veered a little bit off your question. Though. That's okay. That's okay, though. <laughs> I want to bring it back. Um, you know, I, I think that it's it, it's really um, it's really important um, that we kind of challenge these 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 ideas that get put out there um, about what we can do and can't do. And so when I think of young people today, first of all, I am so proud of young people today. So if you are mm -hmm. a young person, however you define that, I'm like. Hey, if you're 30 and under, you're I'm like a young person. I mean, if you're 50 and under, some I'm like you're a young person. But generally, I'm when I say that, I'm thinking of high school, you know, 18 and under folk in particular, or even into your early 20s. 
I came out when I was 19. I was telling these folks in this talk earlier, I had multiple comings out, 19, 23, 24, um, that they are just so brave. Every generation, mm -hmm. there's a different type of bravery. Sometimes we forget and we say, oh, look at Stonewall or look at, you know, Compton, you know, cafeteria or these different sort of activist moments and queer struggle or in, or even mixed race. That's the other stereotype. Mixed race people just want to be right. Homer and Plessy, right? All these cases, mm -hmm. three old man, you know, who passed for white, but Thurgood Marshall, all these people who could have chose to do otherwise and they get stereotyped, right? Or we get stereotyped as we don't want to engage in these um, political issues. And actually, mixed race folks have actually been really fighting on the side of racial justice. So I want to put that out there for absolutely you know, for a long time too. So I think that's really important to acknowledge. Um, yeah, so, so, so important. Um, yeah, so yeah. I'll stop there. Yeah, yeah. Um, one of the things that uh, I've been asked this question a number of times, and the first thing that pops into my mind is fearlessness. I would definitely tell myself to be fearless. I, I remember as a young teen and just having so many concerns and worried about everyone else and their opinions and views about me. And so I appreciate you speaking to that, being yourself, uh, loving the skin that you're in. Those are such great things that um, at a young age that I'm sure we all could have really learned and grew from. Um, actually speaking about the younger generation, uh, I wanted to switch gears just slightly um, and focus a bit about career development. We talked a, a lot about personal and, and uh, your younger self and growing up and wanted to ask if, if any, uh, how has being mixed and queer impacted your professional life? And this is to help with any of our young professionals that are on the call with us today. I think the first thing I would say, and this is something I share with students or friends or family or just anybody really, um, learn to be your own best advocate. And I know that that's hard, but it means, and so what does that mean? Ask questions, uh, show up, um, don't take no necessary for an answer. There's always another way. Uh, bring your full self because it actually is a gift. And so I think that's the other thing that I've learned to go back to your earlier questions about what's the best thing about being queer and mixed is that it's a gift to me. It's creator, like everybody's not spiritual or religious or whatever, you know, but I believe in a creator and a, and a, and a, and a God. And I believe that, and whatever you could say the universe we're created the way we, so if you don't believe in that, the universe made you the way you're supposed to be. Mm -hmm. why, why would you be here if there was something if you weren't supposed to be? And so bring your full self. And I think for me, what I've also learned, one of the best things is that I, I figured out a way and I have to say it's not easy. Again, I don't want to sugarcoat this because I think I feel blessed. Like the last time I did a Google talk and they, I was asked like, wow, you've done really well with all these different things. That's not everybody's experience. And look where you are. And is that a privileged position and a place? And how do you negotiate and manage that. And I think, I, I also think, well, A, I worked really hard. A, I had a lot of help. I had community. I had medicine, you know, behind me. Um, and so I think the way it's impacted my, you know, in terms of career is most, particularly if it's academia, but I think you can do this in anything, bring your real, bring who you are. And mm -hmm. if they're not ready for it, they need to get out of the way. And that's the only way we knock things down. And sometimes you can't, you don't have to do it loud or whatever. If there's different ways, be strategic about it. Find people who are your kin, who will support you in that. Um, and for me though, I have, I mean, if I look at everything I've written book wise or articles, it's been about being either mixed or queer or both, or, you know, the very specific identities, Creole, right? Which same thing. Um, and so I think I've been, tried to incorporate that. If you're a teacher, talk about who you are as a teacher. If you are a chemist, talk about who you are as a chemist and why you love it so that other people know that, you know, there's all kind of people who are chemists, right? Or um, whatever you do, if you're a fireman, whatever that might be, or a fire person, I should say, you know, um, that there, you know, was it my mom says, and we try to cite that sometimes she passed away of breast cancer in 2012. 
um, the sky's the limit, right? And I think mm -hmm. that not enough of us recall that. My mother, I, I share this sometimes when I do talks. I was five, I think, six, I guess six. Um, I flunked the first grade and I, I love to tell my, my students that too when I teach my education class in particular. And I mm -hmm. would say, Dr. Jolovich, you flunked the first grade. What? How the hell does that happen? You took bad naps, and you know, <laughs> what do you really do to fail first grade? And I explain, you know, we had track classrooms in the '80s. Isn't it interesting that the only person that failed was also a half black, half white young man um, or boy child? Um, so interesting, right? You don't fail. I say the mm -hmm. teacher fails. Like, what are we doing in our education system to make space that who want like sitting in a chair in a row of desk? For, for eight hours, that's not how we should be learning. That's not conducive. Mm -hmm. So it's not just mm -hmm. about content, it's about methodology. Um, but you know, I say my mother in that moment gave me something that so many young people need, mixed, queer. She took me to a bathroom mirror. I had to stand on the side of the tub so I could look up into the mirror. And she said, Andrew, I want you to say, I am somebody. And I want you to repeat it three times. And so I said, I am somebody, I am somebody, I am somebody. Right. And I share that with my dad even to this day. And I'm actually, you know, I want to shout him out. He's dealing with some health stuff right now. And I love him so much. And, um, you know, since she passed, he, I've continued to learn so much from him. It's like that life cycle of parenting that you never stop. Or as a teacher, if you're not a parent or as a community member that we continue to like, always even in like he's sick and he's telling me about all this stuff at home like checking on me you know and i think that we talk about that moment and what my mom was sharing and what he would tell me or we talked about race issues growing up or him talking to me about the south and um you know i think that take the full sum of all your experiences and this is part of the advice to your younger self and the professional piece is I try to take all those pieces and and share because that is part of the healing for myself, but it also helps in that way for others to feel healing. It's something I shared with the folks in the talk earlier. I said, um, when I first disclosed my HIV AIDS status in, in 2000, well, five actually publicly at my job when I used to work at Francisco State, one of my colleagues, Rafael Diaz, um, who's an international expert on Latinos HIV AIDS, um, Rafael said, Andrew, are you sure you want to disclose? He said, what are you giving up? Um, you know, um, is this the, is this the right time? And I said, you know, I thought about it and as a gay man of color, I have a responsibility. Not everybody is going to feel that same way or have that same space to do it. And, and I was sharing that in that time since 2005 over these, what, 15, 16 years since I've been talking publicly about this, breast cancer survivors, um, a young woman who's, cre uncle, who's Creole or her uncle's Creole and came up to me after a talk, both, you know, kind of crying, sharing their experiences, saying, you may help me reconnect with my uncle who was gay, but had could not be out. And, you know, people assumed he was white. And I wonder about his struggles with race and queerness and what that meant for him. This is allowing for our healing. And that's that radical love I was talking about that when we share who we are, we allow, we give others permission, right? It's kind of like the Nelson Mandela quote, right? When we let our, our light, that light shine, right? We give others permission to do the same thing. And so right. I think let our stories, you know, speak. And it's something that really helped me in that moment with my diagnosis. Um, some friends had organized a prayer ceremony, a pipe ceremony, um, a prayer meeting. Um, and um my friend um, who's a medicine person who's now an ancestor, Daniel Freeland from the, the Navajo Nation, he said, Andrew, you need to, I don't want you to think of yourself as sick. You know, mm -hmm. um, he said that when you share your story, you're sharing your brother and your sisters um, in your community, their stories too. You're carrying that. That's a responsibility. You have some accountability and, and we're your medicine and you're our medicine and you have to carry that with you and that'll heal you. And, and I really took his, those words, so, you know, it's been 19, um, 19, almost next year, 20 years um, uh, since that diagnosis. And I carry that medicine, that healing with me uh, every day. Yeah. 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 Um, thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, I really love what you shared about your mother as a mother of a child who identifies as queer that resonated with me immediately. Um, and 
So I just, I just thank you for that. And I love the way your mother shows up, showed up for you and your father is currently showing up for you and being that support system that you need. And I think that many individuals who identify as mixed and queer need that support system. I mean, everyone needs a support system, um, regardless of how you identify. And I wanted to ask, uh, are there mentors or um, others who have also showed up for you and how did they show up? Because we talked about that kinship versus um, being an ally. And, you know, if you could just share any other situations or individuals who have showed up for you and how they have. Sure. And then just one quick other point I was going to mention, because you, so you mentioned my mom and then I'll talk about some other folks. Another thing that really just shows me the depth of our humanity when we listen to each other and that, that, when I say ceremony, right? Or I say kinship, this is what I mean. Um, instead of solidarity, I talk about ceremony. And so I think that um, it was very interesting when I came out the second time, the first time was in the college newspaper at a Catholic you know, university. And I, it was a story, uh, what if Jesus was a homosexual, which actually is a play on Mary Daly, a philosopher's conversation about the Holy Trinity being queer because there's no female presence there. Um, interesting philosophical ideas, but it was me kind of pushing back. And at the time I identified as bisexual and came out in the paper because the editor at the time of the University of San Francisco's Jesuit um, university had written some very anti-homophobic thing. And I said, well, I came out and then I came out later to my parents and my dad, because my uncle's gay and my uncle has been one of these other mentors I was going to mention. Um, my mom, my dad was cool. Cause he was like, okay, all right. Cause he was used to his brother, you know? And, and my mom was like, mm, I'm not so sure. Fast forward. She spends years as met partners and it prop two. Um, uh, oh gosh, prop eight, um, hmm. the gay marriage. And, uh, she's taking classes at the community college because they, they worked at the post office by parents for years over 40 years and they also on top of that that loved kids so they were foster parents group home they had and then they had a daycare toward the end of um, her life and so they're taking their early childhood education class she and some other parent also very religious like my mom and was going on and saying oh this is wrong and they shouldn't be allowing this this is against god my mother had done a 360 because when she met the first guy I dated, she said, you know, he's really handsome, Andrew, she said, but you know, those folks aren't happy. I'll go find y'all some cute girls. And I was, <laughs> and then the next oh day, I was like, well, you know, heterosexuals ain't doing so good either with their 50, I was off flip, with their 51% <laughs> divorce rate. She was like, excuse me? You know, so it took a couple of weeks, but she really said, you know what? You're still my child. You're my baby. I love you. I accept you. And over years, it just became more and more where she became an advocate for mm -hmm. your rights and LGBT rights and said, you know what, you should not, you should understand your child. And and so that was such a beautiful moment. My uncle, Charlie, um, also such a great mentor to me. Um, you know, when I had my diagnosis, it was just good to always have a gay role model around him and his partner been together like, I think 40 years. Um, next year, 40 years it'll be. And he went through so much and just kept fighting and fighting. And just his physical presence was a, um, and being able to talk to him or go to the Castro, which, you know, well, I don't think I, maybe people, I think people know the Castro even nationwide, but a gay district in San Francisco where I grew up. And just to even be able to go there and talk to him about what I was feeling or thinking and, and him never pushing. He was just like, are you sure when I was questioning and saying, take your time and, just always being supportive. I think about uh, my really best, one of my best friends from high school, Rebecca Morales, her dad, Enrique, he was a counselor at the city college and he used to tell us, Andrew and Rebecca, he's like, you guys wanna save the world, you know what, go get your education first. I think mm -hmm. about the mentor who said, get your education. I think about my high school track coach, Dennis Moen, who encouraged me to just, people who just encourage you to be your best self and don't absolutely we have to be a queer person or a mixed person per se, although those are always helpful. Um, Cause I didn't have many of those, I don't think growing up per se um, that I knew about, or they were maybe had to be quote closeted, which is also a problem, right? The whole idea of closet. Mm -hmm. I want to say to folks listening, we don't all have to come out, right? Mm -hmm. the idea that Harvey Milk used to say, just come on out. No, that is coming from a privileged place. And I hope that one day, my, my hope is we don't have to come out as a mixed race person or a queer person. Cause sometimes you have to come out and tell them you're mixed too, right? right. 
about white people and you got a white parent, right? Or mm -hmm. whatever group it might be, or Latino and they're talking about black, whatever it is. Um, because really then that's when we are a part of society, not something that's out of the norm, right? When we have that's to then yeah. share these other things. So, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing. And I, I love to hear that you had such a, a strong network of supporters uh, to, to rally around you and provide you with guidance along the way. As I said, we all need that regardless of how you do you identify. My last question for you is, what are some projects that you're currently working on that would add to this conversation about mixed and queer identities? Um, maybe some of your books or projects that you have unfolding. Yeah, I think, I guess there's two in particular that come to mind, although there's actually a book that I had a chapter that just came out in and it's on uh, multiracial um, Americans in higher education. Um, uh, and that book just came out um, by Stylus. Um, and so in that, I just talk about my experiences being Creole, indigenous, black, Latinx, kind of mix or Afro Latinx mix and just going through from earliest age to now. And like, there's this one section called this multiracial queer bridge called my back um, where I talk mm -hmm. a lot about, you know, what it meant to kind of also have to be, which I think does happen to folks who share these identities with me. They were often asked to be bridges between communities too. And that that can be a challenge professionally too. It can be a benefit, but it, and it can be a challenge. Um, so that book's really great, uh, Multiracial mm -hmm. Americans in Higher Ed. And then um, two books I'm working on. One I'm super excited about because it speaks to your question you like to ask folks about um, what's not on the resume, even though this technically is on the resume. Um, but <laughs> I, I said cooking and poetry, those first loves. So I'm writing a poetry cookbook. It's actually done. It'll be out hopefully next year by That Painted Horse Press. Um, which was started originally by Polygon Allen, Laguna Pueblo, um, Lebanese um, uh, queer, uh, so mixed race, let's celebrate her, mixed race, native, um, uh, lesbian uh, literature um, icon, if you will. And um, some of her mentees have taken up that press. And so it's called Gumbo Circuitry, um, Poetic Routes, Gastronomic Legacies. Um, so it really is a celebration of all kinds of like Caribbean, Creole, mm. fusion dishes, but there's poetry inserted throughout that talk about themes like love, uh, mixed race identity, queerness, um, social justice, you name it, it's probably in there, land, uh, art, you know. Um, and then finally, I'm working on um, my newest book, which, I, well, hopefully I'll finish it at some point. Uh, yeah, it's... Um, uh, queer Indigenous Futurity um, and uh, Kinship. And um, yeah, so this book looks at um, Afro-Indigenous communities across the world, really, like in, in the US, Australia, et cetera, who also idea, um, who identify as queer. So um, Thrivent's Circuitry, uh, Queer Afro-Indigenous Futurity and Kinship, that's that book. So really talking about the way that we thrive as queer, mixed race, Black Indigenous folks. Yeah. Well, it's, it sounds like you got a lot cooking over there. <laughs> so yeah. We, yeah. we look we look forward to, to learning more about that. Um, we only have a few more minutes. We have about uh, 10 more minutes left and I want to open it up for any questions. So I'm going to ask uh, for our technology team to, uh, to help us out and present our first question. All right. Mm -hmm. Um, our first question comes from Sabrina. Thank you, Sabrina, for submitting this. Uh, do you have any advice for how best to approach gatekeeping? As a mixed bisexual woman, I feel like I constantly have to reclaim my identity and it can be pretty exhausting. Do you have any advice for her? Yeah, I think number one is when people ask questions, which that's usually what the gatekeeper is doing, I think we have to ask the question back, why do you want to know? Um, I think we also have to give, let ourselves have permission to say none of your business or not to answer. Um, because I think sometimes we feel like, particularly if it's in a work or professional or school setting, um, even our family setting for that matter, that's even more invasive, right? Sometimes, because that's the other thing we haven't actually broached today. There's so much we could have talked about, right? But being mixed and then how your family treats you when you're mixed or queer in a family 
and how people then treat you on one side versus the other and these different kinds of questions. And so I think part of it is like kind of what we were saying earlier about that advice is coming with the whole self and like pushing back and saying, right. Cause we didn't talk as much specifically about even bisexuality, which, right. What is the stereotype there or challenges? Mm -hmm. Oh, y'all just sitting on the fence and you just haven't chose as if that's not an authentic identity. And so there's so much similarity, right. in being a mixed person of, well, you're just black, right. Or you're just Latino, right. Or you're just Asian or well, you look white. So no, I'm who I am and you don't get to choose who I am. So I think part of that is whatever I would say you feel most comfortable sharing because it's it's work, it's labor. And as, as she as the um, um, question post suggests, right, or, or states, it's so tiring. Right. It is. And so I think sometimes, you know, if it's in a work context, I would document that because that is discrimination, that is taxing and you need to document it. So it really depends, it's very much con contextual, I think that question, mm -hmm. um, in terms of how much labor, it's just what I would tell any person who's even an activist on any topic, like, are you willing to engage this person? It's like someone, when they talk about family dynamics, someone asked me once about dealing with mixed race, family, politic and dynamic, and I said, you know, if you're if it's that tiring and you have to sever that relationship, you have to do what's best for your own um, self care um, and wellness. And so, if you need to sever that relationship, if it's possible, you need to sever it. And if it's something that is a professional one, then you need to document it. And and if you want to, and if you have the personality or the style of where you want to push a little bit, then I think that's where you show up and just tell people and call them on their stuff. Yeah, absolutely. To your point about family, uh, when it comes to family, family, they think that you owe them something a lot of time. Like you owe them an exclamation. Oh, because we're family, I can ask you these things. And and we need to really set boundaries yeah. and like, no, I, I don't owe you an explanation. I don't need to explain a lot of a lot of things to you. And it's OK to say no, um, whether it's with your family or professional. No is a complete sentence. And I, I really <laughs> love that. All right. I think we have one more question. Thank you. So Lily says, is there something that you wish you could tell your younger self about your identity or any general advice for younger mixed and queer people? I know we kind of touched on that a, a bit, but is there any um, in particular in, a, a piece of advice that you would share? Mm -hmm. You know, it makes me think of, and it's so funny now, as you get older, you start to think, where did the time go? How did I, like I told some a friend of mine, he's much younger and I was like, oh, I'm the I'm a role model now, right? And how you think about this. So it's also interesting when we think about what are you gonna advise to give younger people? It's interesting too, is I think as older people, so I think I wanna say first, cause it's a little bit different as someone who's older, let's listen to younger people and, and, and know that mm -hmm. they have many things to teach us um, and that they have hold so much wisdom. Um, and that when we talk about kinship as opposed to allyship, that it is, it's, 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 it's circular, right? It's circular and it's interconnected. Um, and I would say that young people are looking for, uh, not looking for in need, that need we all do, role models. Just like I mentioned my dad, even in this moment where his health, he's still a role model for me, um, you know, and I'm at this age, almost 50 years old and we need role models on what it's like to become then 60 and 70 or 80. So at each stage, we all need, you know, um, role models. And so I think my, again, advice, I think for young folks is, uh, who are mixed and queer is celebrate it. Um, you're going to feel, there are going to be moments where, cause I'm thinking about so many, again, my realness moment here and none of y'all call me later, but exes who mostly have been probably mixed, like, folk and um and you know that there's these things we hold and there is a lot of trauma and things that we're taught or that you're supposed to be a certain way or how you dress or going back to those stereotypes or what are the hard parts or i think about people who would like i'm wearing my hat because i didn't do my little mixed hair here today but you know, it was kind of a mess um you know but people who would stare i'm sure you've had the experience you know people who look at you they're talking to you but they're looking at the top of your hair to be like is it pressed or permed or is it really that curly is it 
that straight? Is it is it your real hair? Is it yes. Your hair, or they will even ask you or touch it without asking you, right? Mm -hmm. you look mm -hmm. at your eye color, or you know the things you hear, right? I've been told, oh, you don't really look like those people, or oh, look like that's a compliment, whatever people it is. <laughs> or right. your looks like this, or you know, just these odd things that people do, or you could pass for straight. Oh, you don't seem until, you, or if you don't open your mouth, I wouldn't know. It's funny because you hear this opposite thing of, you know, I've heard my, like for my dad or other folks who are maybe like lighter or white passing, like, oh, I wouldn't have known you were blah, blah, blah until you opened your mouth. And then there's other people, I would have known you were queer until you opened your mouth or until you did this, right? As if there is a set or a checklist of what right. we are supposed to be. So for young folks, be who you are. Don't let them do however you want to dress. There is no one way of being queer, of being mixed race. Celebrate it, add to it. We love you as you are. You are our medicine. Thank you. Thank you. I think we have one more question. All right. So Peter said, could you talk about finding a balance between yourself and your advocacy? Um, I'm in career. I am college. I'm in college right now. And the administration leaves a lot to the students. I want to help, but it takes a toll on me. Thank you, Peter, for your question. Yeah, Peter, that is such a great question. It reminds me of something I was talking about earlier. Um, I think that there are, there are so many students that get left out, particularly the ones we were talking about. So how we trace and document, we just have a blanket category, multiracial, for example. Um, not even every university, even though they're supposed to be since 2000, tracking this if they want the federal funding. But I don't even think every university actually is still doing it. They should be. But I think we also, I think we hide behind and say, oh, we don't want to discriminate or make people feel uncomfortable. We need to track how multiracial and, and queer students are matriculating. What percentage are being are applying? What percentage are being admitted? Um, what percentage are graduating? Is there something about the mix in particular that that we see particular kinds of patterns of some students who are doing better versus others. Um, I think the balance is that I've always told people because I, I kind of went straight through um, from undergrad to PhD um, and I got, well, I was 27, I guess, when I finished my PhD. Um, and I always tell people who go back and stop and pause, I'm like, Bad respect. I kept going because I knew I was not going back. Um, mm -hmm. It's take patience, be kind to yourself. Um, know that each little thing you do. I was remember we I had uh, an event I was facilitating with um, Angela Davis and um, my colleague Jason Ferreira and uh, tribal chair of the Wintu, um, Colleen Sisk in California, and I had asked them you know, is it, is, should the goal of the kind of work we do particularly is tied to this idea of research justice, but should we be reforming society? Is it better to like, should we strive to reform or transform society? And I remember Dr. Davis Angela, she said, she said, well, that's a silly question. She said, Andrew, she called, she got me really easily because the question was supposed to be obvious. She said, it's both, right? That sometimes some of us are so gung ho that we want to transform tear down the system, remake it. And yeah, we do. We want to change the methods, as I said, um, not just the content. And reform is also important. We have to take those wins when we get them, you know, to just kind of put it in a very basic term, and know that each person you touch, like maybe it's not a thousand people, but you know what? That one person you helped, that one person you talked to, it could be a classmate, you made a difference for that person. And that can be actually so much more profound than talking and, you know, change, you know, a policy or something like that, that because each person, then that person is going to go out and touch some other people. That's what we have to remember. Um, yeah. So, you know, little by little um, is, 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 is a lot. Yeah, oftentimes it only takes one. Thanks so much for that advice. Um, and thank you all for uh, asking questions and engaging. Thank you, Dr. Joe Levette, Mix at Google, Pride at Google, and Gain for making this event possible. This event concludes our week-long celebration of Loving Week. And as a proud member of the Mixed at Leadership team, we thank you all for tuning in and engaging in such a fruitful discussion on intersectionality. Until we meet again, please stay out of trouble, but if you must get in trouble, make sure it's the good kind. I'll see you all later and have a great day.
Thanks, everyone. Hey, Omizi. Thank you for having me.